Because we should uh, get started since it's now 8 o'clock. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, Michael Varner. Uh, he's a professor of maternal fetal medicine here at the University of Utah. And he's also the director of the uh, Center for the for Personalized Health Care here. He's been the director of that for about a year. Um, and his other claim to fame is that he's been married to Kathleen DeGree for 37 years. And uh, to the extent that he said to the extent that his daughters are intelligent and good looking, it proves that he's their mother. So I, I was, w when I was uh, asked to give this talk, I was, I thought, you know, I'm going to go, I'm going to go read the ophthalmologic literature and I'm going to make this a uh, ophthalmology specific uh, talk. And uh, that didn't happen, actually. So uh, if you're expecting that, um, uh, then um, I'll apologize up front. But uh, I have found myself on a steep learning curve over the last year with this uh, whole project. Uh, and I <coughs> thought it was a good idea to let you all know uh, what's going on. And uh, frankly, my, my thinly veiled motive is to try to engage the Department of Ophthalmology in this project, which it really hasn't been uh, up to this point. So, so uh, the first, qu first, uh, first quiz question is this. What was the um, Carnegie Foundation's bulletin number four. And uh, if I can um, make a Socratic response to that, it's what's now called the uh, Flexner Report. And um, uh <coughs> all of us basically in this room have been affected uh, profoundly by that. It was uh, really what uh, introduced uh, science into medicine, uh, what some people might call the first revolution in uh, medicine or medical education. Uh, you know, they say, people who know about these things say that, that human knowledge doubles uh, every 18 to 24 months, which uh, uh, if that's really true, turns out that's not a straight line increase, it's an exponential increase, and we're, we're now into something called uh, uh, zettabytes worth of knowledge, and I, I'm not quite sure how many billion billion that is, but it's a lot of uh, uh, information that we're accumulating on a year-to-year -year basis. And um, certainly in our business, all of our business in medicine, this uh, ongoing, uh, uh, if you will, explosion uh, combined with costs, which we'll talk about in a, a second as well, has uh, really gotten to the point where we ought to be uh, thinking about, people are thinking about, if you will, a second revolution. So, so 1910, the uh, state of the art was uh, germ theory, chemistry, uh, physiology, pathology, physics, and what we're trying to do in those days uh, is understand disease, find it, fix it, and that's still the fundamental tenet of, uh, of medical education and, and by and large of medical practice today. Nowadays though, we've got all these other things, genomics, the omics, if you will, uh, systems biology, uh, informatics, et cetera, and uh, hopefully the name of the game going forward is gonna be uh, predict it and uh, personalize it. Uh, I think, I hope, this is about as close to a oh my god slide as I have, but the uh, historically at, uh, at least, you know, we've kind of been over in this range of this curve, uh, where we can first detect something, uh, where we first intervene, and um, the disease burden tends and cost both tend to be pretty high. And the theory at least is um, that uh, we ought to try to shift towards, uh, if you will, um, at least the earliest molecular detection, if not uh, even back as far as um, uh, trying to alter uh, the initiating uh, events. Um, so personalized, so people say, well, what is personalized health care? And uh, I've heard it said, well, it's, it's kind of like pornography that uh, I can't define it, but I'll know it when I see it. Um, and I don't know if that's really true, but um, uh, Jennifer Logan, who is my um, co-compadre in this, uh, this project and I have, have opted for this particular definition, the tailoring of medical treatment to the individual characteristics of each, each patient. Now, a lot of people um, think of personalized health care as being equivalent to genomic medicine. Uh, it is certainly, genomic medicine is 
is certainly part of it, but uh, uh, it really uh, has to be more than that. Um, in essence, though, trying to, to, prov to provide the right intervention for the right patient at the right time uh, and at the right cost. And I, I, I my, my ventures to this side of the bridge, by and large, are bringing my wife lattes on uh, neural ophthalmology days. So I, I don't really know much of, of w w the day-to-day, -day, I don't really know anything about the day-to-day -day operations over here. But, but, on the, but on the other side of the bridge, is historically at least, cost has been a four-letter word in, in medical education and medical practice uh, both. And I, I have, have been hurling myself on the, uh, <coughs> uh, you know, on the, on, on the a sharp stick for a long time trying to find out how much anything costs, in the, at least around the University of Utah. It's a, a very closely kept secret, and we need to, uh, we need to come out on that. You may hear people talk about something called P4 medicine, which is a nice acronym, acronym but uh, predictive, preventive, personalized, and participatory. And this participatory thing, I think, is particularly important uh, and, and something that needs to be kept in mind um, when we're, we're, we're tempted to think about it as just genomic medicine. Because it turns out that if you're sitting on the sofa eating Twinkies all day, it doesn't matter, uh, doesn't matter what your DNA sequence is because you're going to be way short on methyl groups. So, so the history of this around the university, uh, the abbreviated version, hopefully, is that um, so those of you who were here in 2007, 2008, the, the, the institution spent a year with a, uh, having a research strategic planning process to try to develop a plan for the next decade. The two things that kept bubbling to the top were molecular medicine and personalized uh, health care. Uh, what the management chose to, to try to do was to, to recruit uh, uh, somebody to come in, help us set it up right. The, the number of people out there in this particular arena, it turns out, are pretty small, very small. And uh, what happened basically is they had two people who had a pretty good job where they were come for several interviews, kind of get up to the 11th hour, and then back out. And so I think what we ended up with was that two people who had pretty good jobs where they were ended up with better jobs where they were, and we ended up with nothing to show for it for two years. So um, I got a call to the principal's office uh, back in about uh, February of last year, uh, and I don't get, I'm happy to say I don't get called to the principal's office very often, but Dr. Betts made me an offer I couldn't refuse in terms of uh, would, I, would I serve as the uh, interim director for this project. So as of May 1st last year, I've been uh, involved with this. Um, and for the current fiscal year, at least, um, we've had five program executives, which I'll, I'll uh, zip through uh, momentarily, though, a lot of which, it turns out, overlap with the CCPS. And so we've, we've had a, a uh, collaborative agreement uh, with them <coughs> from the beginning. Uh, one thing I want to tell you a little bit about was a, uh, an online forum and a strategic planning retreat that we had last fall. And then uh, also a little bit about a uh, white paper that I was hoping would have been posted for general um, comments by now, but I haven't quite made it. So the, the objectives are, are basically these, and it's, it's really pretty much the usual uh, suspects. But um, <coughs> we had a grant. Um, we, when we set this up for last year, we, uh, we actually had uh, several hundred thousand dollars uh, on a one-time deal, both for pilot projects and for um, uh, genome exome sequencing, and at the moment we have uh, 154 uh, uh, exomes in the process of being sequenced on six different uh, uh, conditions, um, and hopefully we'll, uh, we'll uh, score something big out of that. We've been, uh, uh, the program has been a supporter of the UPDB, and I know that uh, uh, s several of you have been uh, involved with that, but uh, I'm going to say a little bit about that. Uh, in a minute, and then also something called the Utah Biohealth uh, Initiative. This is a collaborative venture between the university and In a Mountain to try to basically to figure out who's got what in in terms of biologic uh, uh, samples. That's a uh, you know one of the advantages of working in a bottoms up economy, like it turns out we all do, is that um, if you're paying your way, you can pretty much do whatever you want and. Uh, 
um, that's the good news. The bad news is that everybody's pretty much doing what they want and there's, there's not a whole lot of coordination. Uh, I mean, I have my freezer farm. I'm sure there's some, I know there are some number of freezer farms uh, um, in this department too where people have snippets of this or that. I, I bet I have, I bet I, I, bet I have, um, I don't know, pick a number, 50, 100 snippets of people that I've accumulated over the years who've also found their way into, into uh, w one of your biologic sample banks. And there is no way as it currently stands that any of us would know anything about that, let alone who might have something over at, over at Inner Mountain. <coughs> Excuse me. From a, uh, the standpoint of uh, uh, a clinical prospect, this is going to be a, a, a longer haul, but um, uh, we're trying to, one of the things we're trying to promote is clinical pathways, clinical guidance teams, et cetera, uh, interdisciplinary. Uh, that's supposed to be collaboration. I thought I'd found all the typos, but I guess I didn't. Um, and uh, if, if any of you have spent any time in the Intermountain system, that looks an awful lot like uh, Intermountain, and that's uh, frankly by uh, design. Um, if we want to individualize things, it turns out right now the bandwidth of who does what where, at least uh, on the other side of the bridge anyway, is so wide that we it's you really can't tell where normal and uh, it ends and abnormal uh, begins. And so um, trying to uh, decrease bandwidth on clinical practice is a, uh, it turns out to be a very important issue, particularly with, uh, with capitation uh, around the corner, trying to figure out the hot spotting uh, issues. Uh, you know, again, uh, the top 5% of people uh, consume an inordinate amount of uh, resources. Clinical pharma pharmacogenetics, I know, is an issue in every uh, discipline of uh, medicine, and it turns out those polymorphisms that uh, affect my business affect your business, and, and we need to uh, come up with a mechanism to, to, to track that. And then finally, the whole issue of individual and community engagement, because uh, uh, we're not going to bend the co cost curve just by ourselves. Um, we have a, a, an education uh, advisory committee, and we actually have a spring uh, semester course on uh, personalized health care that's being run through the K-30 uh, uh, program. Uh, hopefully it'll be uh, more widely uh, uh, advertised, subscribed. Uh, we're, we're working on curriculum off uh, offerings for the fall and also for a uh, certificate uh, program. Uh, and I, I don't know, have, have any of you heard of our uh, personalized health care discussion groups that meet second and fourth on Mondays at 515 uh, over in the Williams Building. Williams Building is over in Research Park. Uh, it is by definition off campus, and so one can have pizza and adult beverages at 515 on Monday if that's, a, uh, if that's an attraction to, uh, to anybody. Um, we had a travel grants, have the travel grants program where we pay for uh, uh, some number of people to this year to go to personalized health care meetings, and we hope it'll uh, sort of jumpstart some interest, and we're planning to do that uh, again next year. Uh, we have another program coming up that may or may not uh, uh, appeal to, to folks here, but personalized health care in women and children's health uh, uh, in May, and we're planning uh, several more for uh, this upcoming, uh, upcoming year, probably in September to have a, a couple of day uh, uh, session about the UPDD. Uh, this year is the 30th anniversary of the, the executive order to set the UPDD up, and so um, we hope we can uh, uh, not only open the uh, uh, open the uh, the gates a little bit wider, but uh, also have some some sort of a fresh shrift about uh, what's been accomplished to this point. Uh, we'd like to th to think of ourselves, Jennifer and I, in a way, as a if you, as a uh, sort of a uh, communications or information hub for the the institution. We've been around to talk to a, an awful lot of people, um, uh, 150 plus anyway, around the university, uh, Intermountain, the, the community at large about uh, what, they, what they think personalized health care is or, or could be, uh, presentations like this, um, uh, et cetera. And again, we, we hope we can be a, uh, a uh, information hub and a communications uh, center. I mentioned the, the CCPS, and again, we have a lot of things, uh, uh, areas in, uh, uh, in common. 
uh, we've had the uh, CCPS review our, our grant uh, uh, submissions, um, the course that we talked about, and uh, at least one more coming up. Uh, you know, on my computer screen, Vivian Lee doesn't look nearly as pixelated as she does there, but um, everybody knows that she arrived in July, and um, one of the things that she, uh, several things she keeps talking about, bending the cost curve, personalized health care, increased uh, uh, collaboration with um, uh, Intermountain. And um <coughs> she, when she was the, uh, the, the, I guess the, the, the dean for research at NYU, she set up a program where, where uh, sort of a web blog where everybody in the place could, could either list or comment on somebody else's listed topics for uh, uh, research uh, ideas. And people ended up sort of populating themselves, self-populating themselves into to groups, working groups, and um, it was very successful there. And <coughs> uh, she uh, suggested, so to speak, and you know, when the dean suggests, uh, it's always a good idea to listen, that we do the same sort of thing here, uh, which we did, um, and it was really quite, uh, quite remarkable. We had, uh, ended up with 82 uh, topic areas, 450 some people uh, uh, authored comments, and uh, sort of more or less distilled to these same, uh, these same uh, issues here. Um, the uh, one of the people in uh, at the at Ski at the computing supercomputing ins institute has a, a little pro program that will will scan through uh, a, a word document and then then uh, uh, list all the words the size being the uh, reflection of how frequently they're they're mentioned and uh, treatment risk information genetics uh, uh, the usual uh, again uh, suspects there but. Uh, we had a, had this retreat back at the end of or the beginning of uh, December, end of last year, um, and so one thing I learned from this is that that uh, the term strategic planning retreat and the number 277 actually don't go together all that well. Uh, it's uh, it's pretty hard to get get uh, granular with that that many people. Uh, but we had uh, uh, attendees from. Uh, a wide number of areas, all the health sciences colleges, a fair amount actually of the university, um, and uh, uh, a number of cultural business communities. The one thing, two things that were were notably uh, missing here, uh, uh, one was the uh, the payer community, and the other was the uh, Department of Ophthalmology. So, um, uh, who was the only ophthalmology representative? And um, I, I'm <coughs> it was kind of given away already. It was my wife, and she. She was there because I made her be there uh, to give one of the, the talks. And so I, I am hoping that, that uh, if nothing else uh, uh, out of this hour, that uh, uh, I'll be uh, successful engaging, in engaging uh, you all in, in this uh, project going forward. So uh, the, the essence of it was we had a bunch of talks on Wednesday after this is a Wednesday afternoon uh, about infrastructure, about various clinical uh, possibilities, and we ended up with these uh, focus groups. There were nine of them all together, looking at these topics, and then each group gave a, a report that afternoon. But um, probably the thing that was most uh, impressive to me out of the whole thing was the 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 uh, the, the number were the number of connections that were uh, clearly established between people who were, you know, two doors, uh, uh, two floors down. Uh, or up from somebody else, or in the next building over, who'd been here for however long and and never knew that somebody else was either here or had any idea of what they were uh, might have been doing. So the the uh, if not again if nothing else, we hope we can uh, 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 help facilitate collaboration and uh, communication on these issues. Uh, this white paper again, I'd hoped it'd be out by by now, uh, but it was a, a summary of uh, of uh, this whole whole process, uh, and I would like to think it's going to take things pretty much down to the ground, but um, uh, I'm going to spend the rest of the, my time just kind of going through some of these uh, priorities that came out of it. Uh, UPDD <coughs> access, family history, pharmacogenomics, um, the uh, consolidation of research databases, 
issues of health uh, economic comparative effectiveness research, et cetera, point of care education, uh, and then uh, a little bit about multidisciplinary and, and specialty uh, pathways in education. So if nothing else, this slide is going to show up a few more times in the next few minutes. It'll give you some idea of uh, how much more of me you'd have to listen to. Uh, I mentioned the, the UPDB, and again, it's, it's been around uh, for 30 years. Uh, there was a time, you know, 10 years ago, where, where people could say, well, uh, uh, the UPDB and Iceland and perhaps um, uh, Sweden and Norway uh, had the best uh, genetic epidemiolo in epidemiology resources in the world. Um, and it turns out that uh, between Iceland imploding and, and relatively more effort being put into uh, the UPDB, um, it really does seem as though we've gotten to the point of it being the, the biggest, the best uh, uh, genetic epidemiology research resource on the, the planet. It's governed by something called the Resource for Genetic Epidemiology, which is, is a, a uh, confederation of the major players in this. The, the university, uh, the church, and uh, the health department, Intermountain more recently has a, a seat at the table. Uh, and they, they, to their credit, keep a, uh, uh, a careful watch over all of their data, uh, and to this point at least have not had a uh, security breach, which is something that they're um, uh, planning to, to maintain. Uh, but uh, it's a really remarkable uh, uh, resource for looking at a a whole lot of different uh, uh, different things, um, and uh, I know again, I know some of you all have been uh, involved with it, uh, and to the extent that that uh, uh, conditions you all deal with can be uh, intergenerational, to the extent that they can be uh, uh, co-segregated with other conditions, uh, it really is a, a unique uh, resource. Uh, it's not uh, not free, on the other hand. Uh, they will, if you are if you are working towards a grant, uh, uh, perform at least a limited number of hours of work to try to gather preliminary data. Other than that, though, it ends up being uh, a, uh, a fee for service uh, exercise. Um, if you can collect your own data, or if you can analyze your own data, and they just provide it to you, uh, it ends up being pretty economical. If they're going to analyze it for you as well, it starts to get a little uh, a little pricey. But you can come up with all sorts of things. This is a uh, uh, slide that I, I got from uh, Randy Burt over at uh, HCI, just looking at a, a uh, family pedigree for colon cancer and uh, colon uh, polyps. Um, and again, can look at all sorts of, of different things. Family history is a, uh, another uh, important thing that, that uh, we want to try to try to emphasize. And uh, people say that genetics is family histories or family histories with data, uh, which I think is probably true. And the flip side of that, of course, is that most of the family histories that any of us in clinical medicine collect are not worth the paper they're printed on because people, we only get, if we actually ask people uh, in detail, we only get what they know, which uh, is more often than not uh, incomplete at best. and and with uh, some, some regularity, uh, not only incomplete, but I inaccurate. So um, again, they're only as good as the questions that are asked and uh, the information that is, uh, that is known. Uh, on the other hand, you know, with current informatics technologies, all of us, at least who are engaged with a healthcare provider, have a, a uh, problem list someplace. And uh, I would contend that that we can and, and perhaps even have an ethical obligation to, to have to do better than uh, what we do. Uh, and that's, uh, again, because we need uh, these uh, family histories to uh, be able to utilize computerized uh, decision support, which is something I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. Um, again, identify co-segregating diseases of, of all sorts. What would it take? Um, well, one is, is uh, uh, an appeal to, to families, which is something they probably sell better in Utah than a lot of other, other places. But if, if we're constructing a family history, uh, an accurate family history, a complete family history, well, we're not only doing a service to ourselves, but to our uh, uh, families in the future. Uh, 
on the other HIPAA, uh, which is actually HIPAA, that's, uh, that's actually stands for how is it possible to accomplish anything, uh, uh, is, a, is a real issue in this sort of thing, and you have to, you're going to have to have people uh, uh, presumably opt in for, for sharing their um, uh, a PHI with uh, other people in their families, and uh, it's going to be have be un invariably there's going to be well I don't want to share it with my my uncle John because he's a jerk and he owes me money, um, uh, or I don't want everybody to know that I'm HIV positive. So it, it'll be a big uh, a big project, um, but it is uh, certainly something that needs needs to be considered, um, and it, it's it needs to be a community wide effort because. If I if I get my health care at the university, but my sister gets her health care at Inner Mountain, well then, uh, what good is is that? We're not any better off than the, even if we use my uh, problem list, we're not any better off than where we were uh, before. So again, no one health system is going to be able to to do this alone. But uh, only by having all this uh, this information, accurate and complete information, can uh, any family history tool ever be ever be functional. Long-term personal histories uh, are also important. I mean, not only from, uh, from generation to generation, but long-term for, for me. I mean, what do the things that I uh, uh, am dealing with now portend for me in the, in the future? Um, uh, you know, one example, I, I don't know, if is Greg here? I don't see Greg. Anyway, Greg Hageman and I have had some uh, uh, conversations over the last year or two about about uh, this issue of co-segregation that uh, uh, women who have preeclampsia, it seems, which is something I deal with, are uh, would seem to be more likely to show up with uh, macular de degeneration 50 years later at uh, uh, at your place. Um, any number of of environmental uh, exposures, uh, gene environment. I mean, uh, I, 25 years of living here, I've I still don't think it's right to see the air that you breathe. Uh, uh, and uh, at least, uh, again, and I'm sure there are ophthalmologic uh, effects of that. Uh, premature labor is something that I deal with or that uh, comes and goes in relation to, uh, uh, relation to air, air pollution. And then finally, there's this, this, this whole issue of, of uh, systems biology that the day, you know, a lot of us got a, uh, Got a lot of papers written about uh, associations with this or that SNP, uh, et cetera. But uh, it turns out that it's a, a lot more complicated than that, and uh, we're going to we're going to need long-term personal histories, family histories, to really sort uh, the the truly complicated nature of biology out. So pharmacogenomics, uh, uh, all of us know that that um, uh, uh, one size. The, the adage of one size fits all, either in terms of diagnosis or treatment, uh, just doesn't hold water. Um, one of the sort of the, 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 the big, well, first off, oncology has been uh, very much the poster child for uh, pharmacogenomics uh, in the past decade anyway, and, and that really got tipped off with this stuff called uh, uh, her Herceptin, which is a, uh, a uh, uh, medication that is very effective in uh, uh, women who, who have uh, uh, a specific uh, protein on their breast cancer cells, and if you don't have, if, and if you're unfortunate enough to have breast cancer, and likewise don't have uh, uh, this particular protein, this stuff doesn't work uh, really uh, at all. So this has been sort of the poster child for this uh, whole idea over the last, uh, last decade. And it's brought up a, a, a what to this point is a, a, has become a very big deal uh, in the in uh, pharma's world, which is companion diagnostic uh, testing. Which is, I in fact, the FDA just had a ruling back in July, the essence of which was that if you have a medication and uh, evidence that that there is a genomic marker uh, that will identify who will or won't. Uh, respond or who will or won't have uh, 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 adverse drug reactions that that you're uh, obliged to uh, uh, have that test uh, uh, run in association or at least prior to administering your uh, uh, medication. In oncology, 
Um, you know, there was a paper a few weeks ago now that, that just looked at, at uh, um, uh, SNP compositions of, uh, of uh, tumors biopsied from several places at the same time. And uh, the idea that a tumor was homogeneous uh, kind of got uh, shot out of the water uh, at that point. Likewise, tumors develop resistance just like bacteria do. So um, this is going to be a, a, an ongoing game of, of uh, whack-a-mole, I think. But it's, it's important to, to keep in mind for uh, all these new things. Um, a lot of different drugs that, uh, you know, again, that we all use for different things uh, and uh, all of which have substantial uh, rates of uh, poor response, uh, et cetera. Um, the theory, at least, is this, that if, if we have some number of people with a whatever diagnosis, that there'll be a group uh, who either don't respond or who uh, have adverse uh, uh, reactions and that we ought to treat them with, with something else. And then there's the, uh, the rest of us who, who, in fact, should be uh, uh, treated with the appropriate medication. Adverse drug reactions is something that uh, turns out to be a big deal. Uh, and I actually, I don't know how much of an issue it is for, uh, uh, for you all, but across the board, 5% of all hospitalizations are a result of adverse drug reactions. Uh, one in every 10 patients will uh, experience one. Uh, uh, 700,000 injuries, deaths per year, uh, estimated uh, approaching 100,000 deaths per year from adverse drug reactions. And year in and year out for the last 15 years since people have been keeping track of these things, somewhere between the fourth and sixth most common cause of death in hospitalized uh, patients. And adverse drug re uh, reactions, it turns out, cost more than the, the drugs uh, themselves. So it's a, uh, a, lot, of, uh, a lot of money. Uh, it's not easy to sort out because there's, there's all these different uh, 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 cytochrome P450 things and a bunch of other different, uh, different enzymes, uh, et cetera. Um, and I in the world of ophthalmology, are there uh, any of these that, I don't know if there are any of these that, that jump out in, in particular, but one of the things that we'd like to try to accomplish is to, is to uh, get us to the, to the point where uh, we can share information across disciplines about, about where, the, where the hot spots are, what the drugs, the drugs uh, uh, you know, the major uh, uh, adverse drug event uh, issues are. A lot of challenges, though, and it's easy to talk, stand up here and talk about it. There's a lot of studies out there. Many of them are uh, inconclusive. Um, and it turns out that it's not just as simple as genetics, that there's uh, uh, any number of other uh, issues that go into uh, explaining the variability for a given drug, some of which we know and some of which uh, we don't. Uh, and frankly, uh, when you get right down to it, uh, very few studies still at this point that document that uh, genotype guided therapy is better than, if you will, the usual uh, 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 care ap approach of just trying to figure out as we go. One reason uh, for that is that there, there really aren't very many point of care tests available. It's easy to say, well, we're going to check this or that, but, but the reality is if you d have to draw a tube of blood and it goes over to ARUP and it comes back two days later with uh, this or that uh, report, you've already ended up uh, deciding what, uh, what you're going to do. And um, it's going to be uh, something in the hundreds of uh, uh, hundreds of dollars uh, 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 anyway. So uh, I, I have no uh, financial interest in uh, uh, at all in a, a company called DNA Electronics, uh, but um, w we're in the in the course of talking to these uh, these. Uh, folks about a, a collaborative uh, effort here. And what they've come up with is a, basically it's a little device that um, you can spit into one end of it. Uh, uh, you mix, put the cap on first, and then you mix it up, and basically there's uh, some number of pro uh, proteinases, uh, uh, RNA issues, et cetera. The other end of it has a USB uh, uh, attachment on it. You put it in your computer. Uh, and in 15 minutes or so, it'll give you a report out of whatever, whatever SNPs you might want to uh, program the, uh, the chip for. Basically, collect the sample, 
slosh it around, put it in the computer, and it, uh, it uh, puts out your whatever results you might want. Uh, I think at least, that, I mean, we'll see, but um, it, it seems like it has the potential in a way to be a, a game changer because uh, you can get results back in uh, 15 minutes. Uh, you cut the lab out of, the, out of it altogether, and so there's a substantial decrease in costs, and it, it may well actually be a technology that's going to uh, uh, tip us over the edge on this uh, uh, pharmacogenomics uh, issue in the next, uh, the next couple years. So stay tuned for that. Consolidating uh, research databases, I basically, I, I think I talked about that a couple minutes ago, but again, uh, if we're really going to uh, uh, get to the bottom of some of these uh, issues in a, uh, uh, a truly personalized and comprehensive fashion, you know, we, we just have to be able to uh, talk better, uh, we have to be able to talk uh, amongst ourselves about who's got what uh, and uh, where it is and how it correlates with uh, clinical outcomes. Um, likewise, in terms of uh, health economics, comparative effectiveness re research, people talk a lot of, you know, we, well, we're all talking about uh, bending the cost uh, curve. Um, <coughs> one cost curve that actually has been bent is the, the cost uh, uh, per genome. And this is just sequencing, but uh, again, uh, it was 1999, which is back here, was uh, $3 billion for the uh, Human Genome Project. Um, uh, you know, coming along here, we're down, you know, we're down now to the, the range of a few thousand dollars. People are talking about the $100 uh, genome. Um, what they don't talk about is how to make sense out of all of that, but there are, there's uh, some s rather substantial progress being made in terms of trying to uh, actually at least look for causative genes for uh, various uh, uh, conditions and, and uh, pedigrees. Um, the idea of, of the whole genome, you know, here's my genome, what do you think, Doc, is a little further out there because uh, all of us have, I mean, we, each one of us has some hundreds of thousands of, of uh, copy number variants, uh, uh, indels, uh, all these different uh, 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 variants of unknown significance that um, we just really can't make sense out of, of yet. But, but certainly uh, the cost uh, of the analysis anyway is decreasing. Now, um, th here's, here's uh, an another uh, quiz uh, for you, though, just to, to demonstrate the uh, sort of the magnitude of what we're up against. And this, these are the, f the five largest uh, eco national economies uh, in the world at present. Uh, measured in trillions of dollars, which are thousands of uh, billions. Uh, and it turns out that the U.S. healthcare system is the fifth largest economy uh, in the world. Um, a third of that is just uh, waste or inappropriate treatment. But even if we knock that out, we'd still be the eighth largest economy uh, in the world. And um, uh, I don't think uh, any of us need me to, to, to say that that's just not a sustainable uh, a, a sta sustainable proposition. Um, one of the other things in the, the program, personalized health care, that we're trying to work on is uh, uh, point of care uh, education. Uh, just as, as an example, this is a, a, uh, uh, a program that actually the informatics folks here have uh, uh, put together uh, looking at warfarin uh, uh, pharmacogenomics and, and trying to come up with a, uh, uh, a, a point of care uh, program that would would help decide loading and, and uh, uh, maintenance doses. So, um <coughs> you know, <coughs> it would come up if we knew the knew the their uh, SNPs already. Uh, it'd come up and say, well, this has this particular person here might have a. Uh, uh increased risk of bleeding complica complications and that they would need to, to either adjust the dose, monitor things, and so what do you want to do? Do you want to cancel that, uh, modify drug doses, what cetera, whatever. Um, uh, <coughs> besides all these, uh, again, the, the SNPs here, there are a bunch of other things uh, up here, age, race, height, weight, uh, et cetera, that go into it, other, other medications. Uh, and it, it, uh, it comes out with a warfarin dose. And again, in, in one place where this actually works pretty well, right now at least, is uh, 
uh, elected joint replacement, uh, the people over at the orthopedics hospital are, are actually doing this a fair amount, and they have the luxury of being able to, to send this off on somebody um, you know, a week before their, their surgery. You show up with a uh, uh, acute uh, uh, PE in the uh, emergency room, well, sending it off is, uh, is a, uh, you can still do it, but it's not, it's not gonna be, uh, at this point at least, not as uh, helpful. So uh, it comes out with an estimated dose, uh, loading dose. Uh, it could say, well, here's how much you need for today. Um, uh, are you taking any of these other medications that might impact it? Uh, the genotypes, um, or if you've been on it for a while. But uh, the point being out of all of this that, that it, it, uh, <coughs> uh, it, it has at least the potential to to uh, not only to educate us and our patients, but also to, uh, to try to minimize uh, uh, prescribing errors. Computerized decision support is, is, is clearly on the way uh, here. All of us are, are being, uh, will, will be obliged to utilize this uh, uh, technology at the inpatient and outpatient uh, records. A lot of different things that it can potentially do. Uh, uh, alerts, reminders, uh, remind us of clinical guidelines, uh, pre-specified order sets, uh, et cetera. Uh, uh, again, diagnostic support and, and clinical care uh, education. Patient education is, is clearly gonna be an important issue too. Uh, uh, not everybody out there uh, realizes or understands uh, how much this whole system actually costs. Uh, uh, the, in terms of getting timely results, back at least, uh, there's a uh, educational uh, opportunity there that uh, uh, patients can, uh, uh, can understand how it is that, that their therapies are, are being uh, individualized, that uh, they can see the consequences, and, and for some things, uh, can potentially get uh, results uh, confidentially. The, uh, the issue, one of the things that's, that's clearly gonna be coming up uh, more uh, in the next uh, the next year uh, around the institution is the, the idea of uh, some some form of, of multidisciplinary uh, uh, clinical pathways and uh, to be perfectly honest with you I'm not exactly sure what form that's going to take uh, Dean Lee the the he Lee not the she Lee uh, is is very interested in uh, 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 looking at at uh, clinical pathways from the standpoint of drug diagnostic device uh, development. Uh, Jennifer and I are, are somewhat more interested in looking at multidisciplinary approaches to common diseases and problems. Uh, pretty much every clinical entity, clinical uh, department deals with diabetes, but we all deal with diabetes in our own separate way. We don't uh, necessarily know what the, the guy in the next clinic uh, down, the, down the hall or across the bridge uh, might be doing. And so uh, from an educational standpoint, that's, uh, that's gonna be an important issue. And then the last thing to talk about is education. Uh, Josh Schiffman, who's a pediatric oncologist, is uh, uh, serving as our education committee uh, chair. I mentioned we have this course uh, going on uh, this spring. We'll be offering it again uh, next spring. Uh, we're working on a certificate program and, and uh, again, the uh, the uh, pizza and adult beverage discussion group uh, will be starting up in uh, May. I think the first one is May uh, 14th. Uh, uh, and again, we're trying to get out and talk to uh, talk to folks about uh, about this issue. It, it is uh, important. It is pretty clearly the way forward. It's Vivian Lee's idea of the way forward. Uh, and so we need to uh, we need to at least uh, know what's coming. So. Uh, <coughs> from our perspective, at least, we think uh, uh, personalized health care is going to involve a, a paradigm shift uh, to, uh, towards individualized care that uh, uh, we hope will maximize uh, health uh, and minimize both morbidity and unnecessary costs. Um, we think it's more than uh, 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 genomic medicine, needs to be more than genomic medicine, uh, and that it's going to represent a commitment uh, not only by the entire health si uh, sciences center, uh, but uh, uh, the 
Utah community at large and, and for that man matter, uh, the country. And uh, our, one of our uh, sort of mantras in this whole thing is that we are actually now all in it together in the days of individualized uh, 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 silos, if you will, uh, not only in terms of research but clinical practice, uh, really need to be uh, reconsidered. So at any rate, this is uh, my uh, contact information. Uh, Jennifer Logan is uh, my uh, partner in crime, and Connie uh, Barth is the person who really keeps uh, keeps the wheels on things. Uh, we have a, a you know a, a, a list serve for these uh, uh, discussion groups and other things in terms of uh, uh, upcoming uh, events. If you're any of you are interested in that, well, uh, the best way to get uh, on it uh, directly is to just send an email to to uh, Connie. If you have any questions about any of this stuff, uh, please feel free to give me a call, call or send me an email anytime, and uh, I'm happy to uh, talk about this for, I bet, longer than any of you would care to listen. So thank you for your attention, for letting me come, and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Stunned silence. Anyway, well, thank you. <laughs>